Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back. Um, I'm very pleased to see people keep returning. I don't know if you're gluttons for punishment or you're just really determined, but I'm glad that you're here. Uh, before I get into the talk for this afternoon, which is on um, Christian monasticism in preparation for our visit to St. Catharines, and we'll talk specifically about St. Catharines as well, um, I, I did want to make one more comment about the Islam. A number of people have had questions about things, and I realized after the talk, I mean, there's always so much more that you could say. I, I, I throw so much stuff at you anyway, but um, one thing that most Westerners do not get, and you hear it said, and yet I think most people don't believe it, is that the vast majority of people who are part of the religion of Islam have no desire to do violence to anyone else. There is a thin, a thin layer within Sunni Islam, within Shia Islam, that are militant. I'm going to get into a little bit of the reasons for that when we talk about uh, history, culture, and conflict in the Middle East later on. But it is true that the vast majority of people who follow the Islamic faith do want peace as much as any of us do. Um, in fact, if you look at the history of almost any religion, there will have been some factions at some time that advocated violence. The Reverend Jim Jones in Guyana claimed to be Christian. You know, uh, the, the incident in Waco, Texas with David Koresh and the Branch Davidians, and on and on. I mean, we could, there are periods of time uh, during the first century, the Jewish zealots were considered terrorists because they were fighting for what they thought was a political and religious cause. There are parts of Islam that are, advocate that. There is nothing inherently in the Quran that is any more violent than any other religious writing. You will remember that the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible, talks about an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, um, that God ordered the Israelites to, when they conquered Canaan, to, to kill every man, woman, child, and animal. And some people look at that and say, that's uh, atrocious. The same thing that the Christian Bible was used to defend the institution of slavery until the mid-19th century. Every religious writing can, if people try, be twisted to try to support, advocate, defend acts which we consider completely inappropriate. There is nothing more about the Quran than any other writing. People talk about, well, there are verses in the Quran that say you must kill the infidel. Yes, there are. There are just over a hundred verses that are called the sword verses. But in virtually every case, those verses are, re are referring to when the people of Islam, when the Muslim people are attacked, that they are told they have the right to fight back. In fact, the first surah, the Quran has 114 chapters called surahs, and that's broken up into what we would consider verses called ayats or signs. The, the most important of the surahs of the Quran is the first surah. It's the longest one. And in it, it says that if you are attacked, then you should defend yourself. And you should defend with equal violence that you're being attacked with, but no more. And when your enemy stops attacking you, you stop fighting them back. And throughout the Quran, that, and yet, obviously, people who want to advocate for violence take those verses out of context, and they say, this is what Islam is all about. I have read the Quran, it is no more, again, it can be twisted like any other religious writing, but inherently there is nothing more about that that, that advocates for violence than the Hebrew Bible, the Christian Bible, or anything else. It is a matter of interpretation. And the vast majority of Islamic people do not interpret it in a violent way. I needed to get that in there, because I think that's a very important message we need to hear in the West. That does not mean, and please understand, I'm, I'm not Muslim. I'm not advocating for this particular religion, religion over others. I'm a Christian. In fact, I'm a Christian minister. But we have an obligation to be fair and to tell the truth about things and not, uh, and not make accusations that are not reasoned and not fair. So we need to be careful about that. All right, I just needed to get that little editorial comment in there so you all know where I'm coming from. We're now talking about Alone in the Desert, which is what I'm calling our discussion of Christian monasticism in the Middle East, and especially in Egypt, in preparation for our visit to St. Catharines. Every, um, by the way, I just wanted to say, this is the last of our April talks. T tomorrow morning, we start with Lawrence of Arabia, Bedouins, and the Allied victory in the First World War. And then in the afternoon, you have a chance to watch the wonderful movie, uh, Lawrence of Arabia which has been listed as one of the top 10 movies of all time by the American Film Institute. So even if you saw it a long time ago, come watch it again, because the talk in the morning and then the movie in the afternoon, and I'm not sure, I think it's at 2 o'clock, but they'll list in your bulletin tonight that you receive tonight what time tomorrow afternoon. We're starting it early because it's a long movie. 
and we'll have a break in the middle. So we'll do, do that, and then Mystery of the Nabataeans and Petra, and then two talks about Egypt before we land um, in Safaga and visit Luxor. And then we've got, you know, we have five days at sea here, but then we've got uh, six days, I think, where we're going to be on land every day seeing something spectacular, all right? First, almost every religious belief system in the world has had monks of one kind or another. They have had monastic life. Whether they be Buddhist or Hindu, Jain, the Jainist religion, um, and both of these are Jain, the one on the right, lower right, part of the Jain belief is that you must preserve all life of all kinds. And so a strict observer of Jainism will wear a mask in order not to inhale any insects. They will carry a small broom and as they walk, they will brush the, the ground in front of them so they don't step on anything that is living. If the, they have a particular aspect of monastic life that is very uh, severe. In fact, if you can see here, there are two men sitting at the base of this huge statue. And if they look like naked men, that's because they're naked men. The most um, committed of the Jain monks are called the sky clad, which means they're clad in nothing other than the air. They go around completely buck naked. They have no possessions of any kind. They are the strictest, probably, monastic order in the world. But we also have Confucian monks from China. We have Shinto monks from Japan. And even, not today, but in the history of Judaism, we've had, they've had a couple of different. The Essenes were a, a <laughs> monastic order during the time of Christ. Uh, they have had the... the, the a pledge of the Nazarite. John the Baptist was a Nazarite where they lived a very monastic life. You remember John the Baptist was out in the wilderness and he wore uh, he wore uh, very rough clothing and he ate locusts and honey. He was living a very uh, monk-like life. The word monastic or monk comes from the Greek word monathos, which means alone. Monos, one, alone. And so monastic orders throughout the world, virtually every religion has had some kind of monastic order with the exception of Islam. Islam does not have monastic orders. In fact, they're specifically said they're not supposed to deny themselves, they're supposed to get married, and all of that. It's a very different kind of thing. But in all of the world of religions, uh, probably with the possible exception of Buddhism, Christianity has the longest and richest history of monastic orders, both for monks, which is what we usually call a male uh, monastic person in Christianity, and for nuns female monastic uh, order. Now, both in Catholicism and in, Christ in uh, Roman Catholicism and in Orthodoxy, there's a long history. But before there even was a separation, before the 11th century, we had a group of men and women called the Desert Fathers or Desert uh, Mothers or the Hermit Fathers or Hermit Mothers that moved to the Egyptian desert. The Egyptian desert was one of the most isolated places, and these are people who were trying to get away from the rest of society. Um, Egypt was considered the home of Christian monasticism, and this map on the right-hand side, this is the Nile River, this is the Red Sea where we're going to be traveling. All of these locations here were the sites of major Christian monasteries in Egypt. The first of the monasteries started in the third century, that is in the 200s, and at one point, by the 5th century, I mentioned this earlier, one visitor to the Egyptian desert said there were more than 30,000 men and women living as monks and nuns in the Egyptian desert, more than the size of the typical cities in that time. Many of It started out with these people just trying to get to a life of solitude. They would live in caves, literally in holes in the ground. They sometimes would inhabit tombs in cemeteries. Um, but just to get away from things. Now, there are several reasons why they did that. I'm going to get to more detail of that. Um, some of them did it for the desire to pursue a spiritual life. The whole point about monastic life is that you are trying to set aside worldly pursuits, working for a living, all of the things that are involved in trying to just keep, uh, you know, keep up with the Joneses or stay busy in the world in order to focus on spiritual things. So many of the people went into the desert in monastic life in order to become more spiritual, to focus on spiritual things. But the fact is that early on, especially prior to the 300s, most Christians were being persecuted by the Roman Empire. And the Romans were taxing Christians more heavily than anyone else. 
A lot of the people who originally entered monastic life in the Egyptian desert did so to get away from the Roman authorities out in the, in the wilderness of the desert. And many of them had been taxed to the point that they could no longer afford to pay their debts, and they fled to the desert in order to keep from being imprisoned because of their debts. The first Anchorite monks were people who were fleeing taxation and fleeing debt that they had. But the first um, and, and the very earliest of the monks, the Desert Fathers, they were hermits. It, that's, that word hermit is based upon eremitic, which means solitary. They were solitary monks. They were living by themselves. The early desert fathers and desert mothers the, uh, had wise sayings that they learned from their spiritual time in the desert. These were collected into the sayings of the desert fathers. This is actually a book that collects those. But it wasn't just the desert fathers. There were desert mothers as well. And they shared their wisdom. The wisdom of the, of the desert fathers and mothers became the foundation of every other monastic rule, every other spiritual movement, in fact in Christianity after that. They became the source of some of the most important, some of the most powerful um, of the popes. When I say powerful, I don't mean personally powerful, but in terms of their effect on the church. So the monastic life in Egypt was very significant to the church. The father, oh, this is one of the um, desert mothers as well. The man who is considered the father of the monastic movement in Egypt, in all of Christianity, is Saint Anthony who's also called Anthony the Great or Anthony the Father. Um, he was born in 251 and he died in 356. If you do the math, he lived to be 104 years old. He's especially famous, he was not the first of the monks, but he was the one that really was seen as the leader of this as a movement, primarily because his biography was written by Athanasius of Alexandria. Athanasius was uh, one of the most important people in the early history of the church. He was one of the defenders of the Orthodox Christian faith against some of the early heresies, like the heresy of Arius that led to the Council of Nicaea, um, the first great council of the church. And with Athanasius wrote the biography of Alexander or uh, Anthony the Great, he really created a model that a lot of other people followed. In fact, the, it's just another icon of St. Anthony. Um, St. Anthony started out as a young man. He was quite well-to-do. His parents died when he was in his uh, 21 or so, and he was kind of set for life. But he was a spiritual man, and as a young man, he went and he heard a sermon in which the uh, person preaching, the minister preaching, quoted from the Gospels where Jesus tells the rich young ruler, go and sell all that you have and give it to the poor and come and follow me. And Anthony felt like those words were specifically for him. So he did exactly that. He sold everything he had. And at first, as I say, he wasn't the first person to have monastic inclinations. At that time, most of the people who wanted to follow a, a, an ascetic life, ascetic means the self-denial, to get rid of all of the worldly things, they would stay at home and just try to deny all those things. Anthony was one of the first ones who actually left home moved out and at first he lived in a tomb on the outside of his village. Later on he still was too close to people so he moved out into the desert and he found an old abandoned fort and he locked himself in that fort. For 20 years he did not see anyone else's face. People would come to this fort and literally throw food over the wall to him. People would come and talk to him through openings in the wall and they were asking him for advice. He had developed a reputation as somebody who's really committed to the spiritual life and very brilliant. During this time, St. Anthony went through um, great temptation, great struggles, and in fact, the supernatural struggles where demons would assault him to the point that they say they sometimes left him near death. This is an illustration of the temptations of St. Anthony. That's a theme that has recurred over and over and over again in art down through the centuries. The temptation of St. Anthony. Well, he continued to struggle against these uh, demonic spiritual forces, and every time he went through this, while he was physically weakened, he was spiritually strengthened. And so more and more people started coming to this fort and trying to talk to him through the wall and pleading with him to come out and teach us, be our leader, teach us how to be more spiritual. So after 20 years, he finally agreed, he opened the door, much to their surprise, at this point, he was almost 50 years old, he was 
physically and mentally and spiritually really vigorous. And he had not done badly. I mean, he was living on just whatever people chose to throw over the wall, but he was quite healthy. He ended up spending the next six years or so teaching and guiding and establishing a direction for the monastic life in the desert. He, um, after five or six years, he decided, I've had enough of people again. And he went, went off into the desert by himself, ended up dying at age 104. But the people that he discipled started a monastery, the Monastery of St. Anthony of the Sea. It is the oldest monastery in the world. It is from the late 200s, um, and late 200s, early 300s. And it is one of the most historic buildings in Christendom. The church at the Monastery of St. Anthony is the 12th oldest church in the world, Christian church in the world. And he is buried um, some 90 feet underneath the chapel at the, uh, the Monastery of St. Anthony. So he was the one that really led the Eremitic, or Anchorite is another word, which means the solitary monastic direction. St. Anthony is the father of the monastic movement. Another man comes along shortly after that whose name is St. Pacomius. Pacomius and his younger brother ended up wanting to become monks. They went out into the desert, but after a while they realized that they were going a little nuts being by themselves and they needed the fellowship and the interaction with other people. So St. Pacomius ended up being the founder of what's called Cenobitic monasteries. Cenobitic means communal monasteries, where they would get together and share the spiritual life and encourage each other and pray together and have worship services together. So St. Pacomius wrote the first rule, it's called, which means a first set of instructions for how a monastery ought to be done. In fact, following his guide, he even gave instructions and the rule as to how to build a monastery and what needed to be included in it. And Pacomius had been a Roman soldier before he went off into the desert. And so much of what he did in designing monastic life was based upon his experience in the Roman army. They, they slept in barracks like Roman soldiers. They ate in a refectory like Roman soldiers. Much of the discipline was based upon his experience in the Roman army. So he created this Cenobitic or communal kind of monastic life. And that led to really the model of monasteries that we think of around the world. This photograph is a, the monastery, one of the largest ever built, which is the monastery of Monte Cassino in Italy. And it, like so many others, is, is fundamentally based upon the rule of St. Pacomius in terms of how it's organized. We have both Catholic and Orthodox monastic orders, and they differ somewhat. The Catholic orders tend to be very hierarchical. St. Benedict of Nursia came along in the West, that is Europe, and wrote a Latin order, which became the basis of a lot of the Roman Catholic monastic life. Uh, from that, we have not only the Benedictine monks, but the Cistercians, the Trappists, the Carthusians. A lot of other monastic orders were based upon the one rule that he wrote. In the Eastern, uh, the Orthodox churches, they are much less hierarchical, much less structured. Almost every monastery is independent. Whereas in the West, the Catholic monasteries, they differentiated between monks and friars. Monks tended to be those who were focused on just the spiritual life, and they tended to be more cloistered, more staying in the monastery, focusing on prayer, saying the divine office. The divine office is a liturgy of worship that it takes seven hours to go through. They had the divine office, divine reading, or Lectio Divina, and then they had manual labor. Those were the three things that the Western monks did. They also divided it up since the divine office, the liturgy, was done in Latin. Not all monks could read Latin. So they divided up the monks between the choir monks, as they were called. They're the ones that could read Latin. They're the ones that led the worship. And the lay monks, they're the ones that had to do all the physical labor, all the manual labor. And that continued up until the 1960s, actually the Second Vatican Council, which did away with doing the service in Latin, and that meant there no longer were differentiations between those who could speak Latin and those who couldn't. But a lot of the monks in the Western or Catholic side of Christianity did interact more with local communities. In fact, they developed a special kind of monk called a friar, and a friar was a monk that was entirely oriented towards serving the community. You know, Friar Tuck, remember the Robin, the Robin Hood thing? He's out there, you know, delivering beer and talking to people and interacting and living with these guys. Friars 
were a kind of monk that specifically related to communities, served communities, took care of the needs of people. Monks, on the other hand, were the ones that sort of stayed within the monasteries and focused on spiritual things. There's not that kind of differentiation in the Eastern or Orthodox monasteries because all of the Orthodox monasteries were oriented toward what they would call theosis, which means union with God. They, the Orthodox monks do not and have never had a time of really relating to communities. They stay behind walls much more so. They're much more oriented toward the contemplative life. Now, the influence of these uh, monks has been significant. Have any of you all ever been to Munich, Munich, Germany? If you ever look at the seal of Munich, Germany, and the fact the name Munich Monk, Munich, the city, was founded by Benedictine monks. And the seal reflects that, the name reflects that. A lot of Western civilization and culture in Europe has been influenced by this. One of the things, especially with the um, Orthodox monasteries, they have a tendency to put them either in very isolated places or else put them behind walls so that they are cut off. Because of the isolation of some of these, they end up being in very dramatic places because they're trying to get out away from everything, and often very beautiful places uh, for that reason. This uh, the Mount Athos here, which is an um, Orthodox monastery. From time to time, they will be in closer to towns and things, but often will be surrounded by large walls. But you get some actual, absolutely beautiful monastic buildings that are put in very remote, very beautiful places. And especially in the Orthodox churches, which have much more of an emphasis on icons as religious symbolism, I'm gonna talk about icons a little bit later, um, then you have extraordinary things, paintings, sculptures, mosaics, that sort of thing in these monasteries. Now, why did they do this? Why would somebody be prompted other than running from taxation, which some of them did, but for those who did it for spiritual reasons, what really motivated them? Well, the primary reason for many of them was that they wanted to follow the biblical example. Jesus went into the wilderness for 40 days, and in that time, while tempted by the devil, this was a time of spiritual growth for him. So either imitating Jesus or imitating the Apostle Paul, who himself denied himself many things. He talks about the suffering that he went through in his ministry, or John the Baptist who, as I say, was one of the early, uh, he took the Pledge of the Nazarite, where he did not cut his hair, he didn't drink alcohol, he ate simple foods, he wore simple clothing. But the main reason, especially from the fourth century on, why these people left society and went off into monastic life is because in the fourth century, we have the Emperor Constantine comes along, and for the first time ever, Christianity is made legal. In fact, it is made the favored religion of the Roman Empire under Constantine in the fourth century. Later on, the Emperor Theodosius would actually make it the religion of the empire. It was the only legal religion later. Well, up until Constantine and the start of the fourth century in the 420s, people who were Christians had plenty of opportunity to, to experience a disciplined life because they were practicing an illegal religion in many cases. Many of them were persecuted. Their spirituality was constantly being tested. And they knew that if they maintained the faith, that their faith was strong and it was pure. Constantine comes along and makes Christianity the official religion. Uh, well, not the legal religion, but the favored religion. And all of a sudden, it was cool to be a Christian. There was no longer any challenge to it. There was no longer an opportunity. Uh, bishops and other leaders in the church, I love this image here. If you can see, it's a gold gold cross and then a gold chain with a gold dollar sign on it with jewels and all sorts of things. The, a lot of Christians who were serious about the spirituality of their faith felt as though Christianity had been completely <laughs> changed toward the materialistic. And that in fact there was no longer a way in which you could stay in society under the uh, official or legal Christianity and still be spiritually pure. And so they wanted to get away from all that. So they left all the materialistic stuff behind and they moved to the desert. So after Constantine, much of the motivation for spiritual, for monastic life was a desire for a purer, a more dedicated, a more serious spirituality than what they thought you could find if you stayed in the world, so to speak. Now in terms of long-term benefits or long-term effect of the monastic movement, it is true that after Constantine, there was a big move toward materialistic 
people would bishops would vie for different positions in different places because many of the many of the sees, as they were called, where a bishop's assignment was, some of them were richer than others. They controlled more land, they had more income, and there was a big competition. When the monastic orders came along, there was a significant recovery from that. There was a strong stream of uh, effort toward the spiritual away from the materialistic. In fact, one of the things that happened is that a lot of the monks from the 5th century on became, or a number of them, became popes. Some of the very best popes, like Gregory the Great and others, who really reformed the church and kept the church uh, or pulled it back onto the right track, it's because they had been monks. They had gone through the spiritual discipline of a monastic life. So this increased emphasis in spirituality, and in fact, the definition of what constituted holiness was very significant. The monks, the monastic orders, they took a series of vows. Commonly, those vows were a vow of poverty, which was getting away from the materialism, of chastity, which means giving up the uh, not only sexuality, but giving up the affections of the world for all the things the world was in love with, and uh, also obedience, to not only obey God, but to obey God's representatives. So all of that discipline meant that when monks started taking leadership roles, especially as bishops and as popes, and there were some parts of Europe, that the Catholic Church, that you could not become a bishop unless you'd been a monk, because it started having that emphasis. Because of the vow of chastity, that's one of the reasons that celibacy became standard for priests and bishops and people in authority in the Catholic Church. That, that whole celibacy thing never caught on in the uh, on the, the Orthodox side, but it did in Catholicism, and much of that was an effort to capture the spirituality that the monks had demonstrated. All right? So that's sort of a background on the monastic orders. We are going to be visiting this place. This is St. Catherine's Monastery. The official name is the Sacred Monastery of the God-Trodden Mount Sinai. This monastery is not the oldest, that is St. Anthony's of the Sea in Egypt, but this monastery was built in the 500s, between 548 and 565. It was built by Emperor Justinian. Justinian was the one who really sort of rebuilt the Roman Empire. He's the one that built the Hagia Sophia in Istanbul, the great builder, he and his, his wife Theodora. The history, very simply, is St. Helena, who was the mother of the Emperor Constantine. She was named by Constantine as the, um, the almost co-empress, imperatrix, he called her. And she therefore had access to all the funds of the Roman Empire under Constantine. She wanted to go, she was a Christian, as Constantine was, she wanted to go and find all of these sacred sites that they hadn't had access to because Christianity had been illegal up until now. So St. Helen, or St. Helena, she's sometimes called, she travels to the Holy Land. She, Helena, identified where Jesus was crucified. She identified where Jesus was born, a number of other sites. She identified the true cross of Christ, or the remains of that. The story was that she wanted to find the cross, and they, they dug at the place at, at what the she believed was Calvary. They found three crosses, and they weren't sure which one was the right one, which one was the one Jesus was crucified on. So she had a sick woman brought from town, and the woman touched the first cross, nothing happened. Touched the second cross, nothing happened. Touched the third cross, and immediately was healed. And so St. Helena said, this is the true cross of Christ. So it was because of Helena, if you go to Bethlehem today, and you go to the, the, the site of the nativity where Jesus was born, Helena is the one that decided that's where it was. If you go to the Tomb of the Holy Sepulchre, where Jesus was buried, Helen is the one that decided that's the right place. She found all of these artifacts from the Christian era, 300 years before her time, and took many of them back to Rome, which was still... Con Constantinople was officially the capital, but there was still a lot of religious emphasis in Rome. And so uh, she carried these things back. So many of the holy sites of Christianity, um, St. Helena is the one that identified those. They sometimes said that if you collected all of the fragments of the one true cross, you could build a fairly good-sized village. 
<laughs> the reason for that was that various churches, if you had the bones of saints, and, I, and, and I'll, I'll explain that in a second, if you had the bones of saints or various kinds of holy relics or a piece of the holy cross or part of Christ's tunic or these kinds of things, even soil from where Jesus was crucified, then any church or cathedral that had those things would be the site of pilgrimage. And what do pilgrims bring with them? Money. Money. <laughs> and so it was a very practical, uh, not only was it a spiritual thing, but it was a very practical economic thing. The reason why the bones of saints became very important, I'm stepping aside from the monastic thing here, is because when the Christians in Rome were persecuted and they began to meet and have and worship and pray in the, ca in the catacombs, literally in the place where uh, other Christians were buried, they discovered, or they believe they discovered, that when you prayed in the presence of the bones of a great saint, especially a martyred saint, then the prayer seemed to come true more often, or they seemed to be answered correctly more often, I should say. And so they developed this belief that the bones of the saints, having them present, added to worship, it added to the effectiveness, the efficacy of prayers. And it reached the point where the, you could not build a church, or especially a cathedral, in Western Europe unless you had the bones of a saint buried underneath the altar, because that made it more holy and that made everything work better. That's because of the original days in the catacombs. That's why the bones of the saints. That's why if you go to Rome now, there's the, the skull of this saint and the, uh, the, uh, you know, the finger bone of that saint and all kinds of stuff because that developed. Well, a lot of this idea of relics comes from St. Helena and her bringing these various things back. This is an icon or image of Constantine and of his mother, Helena, and of the symbol of the true cross. She also supposedly found two of the nails that were used to nail Jesus to the cross. She went back to Constantinople. She had one of those put in the bit of her son's <laughs> horse's, you know, the horse's bit, because he was still fighting battles, and the other one put in, uh, put in his helmet in order to protect him. She thought that would help protect him when he went into battle. We find that kind of weird, but that's the way they did things back then, all right? In terms of the name St. Catherine's, there was a woman, St. Catherine of Alexandria. Um, she was a young woman who was a pagan woman. Her father and mother were the king and queen of Alexandria. They were pagan king and queen. And she became a Christian when she was 14 years old. She ended up converting a lot of people around her. Apparently she was quite beautiful. She was quite intelligent. She was very articulate. She was, she was able to convince many of the pagan people in Alexandria, which is where she was from, uh, to believe in the Christian faith. She said she would never be married because she would not marry anyone who was not as smart and as attractive and as committed as she was. And the only person that met that requirement was Jesus. And so she felt she was wedded to Christ, as is the case with, with nuns today. They are the brides of Christ. So she finally decided that she needed to go and tell the emperor, this is before Constantine, the emperor Maxinius, who was a pagan, she needed to witness to him. So she went to the emperor Maxinius and witnessed to him about that he needed to stop persecuting Christians and he needed to accept the Christ, that he needed to become a Christian. Well, she convinced Maxinius's wife to become a Christian. Maxinius, the story goes, got a whole bunch of pagan philosophers and educators and wise people together to argue with her in public. She out-argued all of them. A number of them became Christians, and Maxinius immediately had them killed. He had his own wife killed because she became a Christian under the influence of uh, St. Catherine of Alexandria. And so he had St. Catherine uh, arrested, thrown into prison, and then the symbol for St. Catherine, which you see here, is a wheel. Because one of the ways they tortured people back then is they would break them on a wheel. They would take a large wheel like a wagon wheel, tie them on it, and then wherever their, their limbs fell in between the spokes, they would break their limbs. It was a horrendous way to be tortured. Killed most people. Her, she didn't die from it, so he had her beheaded. So she was a martyr to the faith. This is uh, icons to her. St. Catherine has always been considered one, what's called the, one of the 14 helpers in the Catholic Church. St. Joan of Arc said that one of the people that came to her, one of the, the saints that spoke to her, was St. Catherine. 
Well, she died in the 200s. It's said that after her death, the story is, angels conveyed her body from Alexandria to Mount Sinai. And several hundred years later, monks who were in residence at Sinai found her body, and therefore they named the monastery that had already been set up there, St. Catherine's Monastery, because of the miracle of finding her body when she actually had been killed in Alexandria. This, again, is the image of St. Catherine's, and um, it's quite extraordinary, as you'll see in a few days. This is the burning bush, the traditional, traditionally understood to be the burning bush. You will be able to take a photograph of it next week. Um, it does not appear to be on fire right now, but the legend was that it was on, it was on fire without being consumed when Moses saw it. This is the monastery. This is Mount Sinai, and there is a shrine on top of it where um, we're told, you know, and one wonders about some of this. This is where Moses received the Ten Commandments. So this is Mount Sinai. The mountain. Let me go back. This mountain behind uh, the. the Mount Sinai is over here. This mountain is the mountain of St. Catherine, which is a much more rugged, more dramatic mountain, actually, than Sinai. So you will see Mount Sinai. We will not have time while we're there to walk up on Sinai. Some people have already asked that question. Uh, this is the tomb of Aaron, the brother of Moses, the older brother of Moses, who died en route to the Promised Land. Uh, you, we will drive by that. Uh, we just happened to have our guide make note of that as we went by. This was not a place that we were stopping and focusing on. But when you're in Petra, they'll tell you also that the tomb of Aaron is somewhere near there. Um, again, I don't make fun of these traditions because I believe that there is truth behind so many of these, but it always reminded me, these two tombs of Aaron, uh, Mark Twain tells a story in his book, Innocence Abroad, when he visited Europe. He said he went to a museum and they had two skulls of Columbus. One of Columbus as a child and one of Columbus as an adult. <laughs> so perhaps Aaron is buried in one of these two places, but probably not both. So uh, we'll, we'll have a chance to see that, though, when we get there. Um, St. Catherine's is not just a very old monastery. It is not the oldest. It is not even the most important in terms of its impact on the Christian faith. There is another, the monastery of uh, St. Macarius actually produced nine popes. So from, in terms of impact on the church, it's probably more important. But St. Catherine's is important as being one of the most famous and because at St. Catherine's Monastery, they have one of the most extraordinary collections of not only manuscripts and art, but artifacts, reliquaries, ossuaries, that sort of thing you'll find anywhere in the world. In fact, they have the second largest collection of early Christian manuscripts and codices in the world. They're, they're uh, exceeded only by the Vatican in terms of the number of ancient manuscripts they have. There, it, it St. Catherine's in 1844, a scholar named Constantine von Tischendorf visiting there, and like so many of these ancient monasteries and even the Vatican, they have things in their archives, they don't even know what all is there. Well, in 1844, von Tischendorf was visiting, and he found the Codex, what became known as the Codex Sinaiticus. This is not the oldest of the Bible texts, but it is one of the oldest. It's very close to being the oldest, and it is the most complete of the major codices. There are several what's called unsealed codices of the New Testament. Unsealed means it's written in capital letters, capital Greek letters. The Codex Sinaiticus, the Codex Vaticanus, which was found in the Vatican, is slightly older, but not nowhere near as complete as Sinaiticus. And then they have another Codex Alexandrinus, which was found in Alexandria. But this is the most important ancient biblical manuscript ever found because it's the most complete, it's one of the oldest, it goes back to the 300s, and it has been very significant in terms of biblical translation as a guide. It was found there and it was loaned to, to Russia. They were gonna present it to the Tsar as a gift just to look at it. Well, the Russians sold it to the British. <laughs> it's now in the British Museum. But uh, just a few years ago, they found one more section or codices. This is like, you know, if you ever tear a book apart, and I don't recommend that, uh, they're in signatures. There are, there are uh, like 16 pages at a time. Well, these codex, a codex is a book made up of these pages as opposed to a scroll. 
Well, they found one more section of the Codex Sinaiticus, and when you're at St. Catherine's Monastery, you'll be able to see this. This is a passage from the Gospel of Matthew, the sixth chapter of the Codex Sinaiticus. That's what it looks like up close. Um, in addition, they have a, many, many other documents. As I say, the second biggest collection in the world. They also have this document, which is called the Actinomy, the Patent of Muhammad. This is the document that Muhammad, traditionally, Muhammad gave to the monastery at St. Catherine's as a promise. It is a, it's a deed, if you will. It's called a patent, but it's a deed that says, you stay here, no one will bother you, you don't have to pay the tax that most Christians have to pay, you are under my protection. And this actinomy has the outline of two hands, which traditionally one of these, and I'm not sure which one it is, is supposed to be the outline of the hand of Muhammad. He was illiterate, he couldn't sign it. So he outlined his hand as a way of saying, this is me, this is Muhammad. This document comes from the 600s, early 600s. In addition to all these very valuable manuscripts, and they also have a, a codex, um, Syri uh, a Syriac codex, Syriac was a different language, which is actually older than the Codex Sinaiticus. It's not as complete, but they had translated from the Greek to Syriac early on. So they have a ton of these extraordinary documents. The museum in St. Catharines is smaller than this room, but everything in there is an extraordinary treasure. I mean, it's not like they got one or two really cool things and then there's all this other stuff. Everything there, scholars just drool over because this is the best there is. In addition to all these manuscripts, they also have an extraordinary collection of icons, the works of arts that they have, of art, especially icons. Many of these go back to the 5th century, and especially 6th century, and that's very important because these are orthodox icons. And the Orthodox Church, based in Constantinople, went through a period, actually two periods, called the Iconoclastic Periods, in which the forces in the church decided icons were a bad idea. And so they destroyed them. That's what iconoclasm means, is against icons, destroying icons. And so many of the most valuable, most beautiful icons of the Orthodox Church were destroyed. But they never got to the Sinai Peninsula. So uh, St. Catharines has the oldest, most complete collection of very ancient icons in the world. They also have over 120 icons from the Crusader period, which is a very distinctive style of icon. There is nowhere near that, that kind of collection anywhere else in the world. Some of their icons are encaustic, which means they're made with wax. You'll notice this looks like it's sort of dripped and torn in places. Um, it's a, it was a particular approach they took to creating icons. The artwork on these things is extraordinary. And you're going to get a special treat because the su next Sunday, the first, is it not the first one? What day is next Sunday? It's the day that I'm doing an afternoon talk on one of the Egypt talks. In the morning at 10 o'clock in here, um, Ava, our photographer, who is an artist and an art student, she's going to do a talk. And she wanted me to make sure I said it's not going to be as formal a presentation as this, but we're going to do it in here so that she can show slides. And she's going to talk about icons. The making of icons in the Orthodox tradition is a big deal. It's almost, you have to almost be a, a monastic order in order to be able to make Orthodox icons. She's going to talk about the process from going out and collecting the wood to, uh, to how it's done, how they're trained to do it, and give you some examples. So the next Sunday in the morning at 10 o'clock, and it'll be in your bulletin, we're going to have a talk in here about icons, and she'll get into that a lot more. But the artwork here, manuscripts, artwork, reliquaries, the various kinds of artifacts that they have from the, the history of the church, extraordinary things. So this is St. Catherine's at the base of uh, St. Catherine's Mountain. Mount Sinai is over here, but you'll have a chance to see all that. And by the way, I'm going to back up because I mentioned this to you before. Can you see um, right there, There's a, it looks like a little shed hanging on the side of the building. When you get there, you'll see it. It used to be, they have a door now that you could just walk in, but it used to be the only way in there until the 20th century was that you had to walk up, they had to agree to let you in, and then they would let down a, a rope sort of sling and rope you up. That's the only way you could get into this building for security reasons. Because for many, many years, this was fortified in order to protect them from bandits. Um, so a fascinating place. Any questions about St. Catharines, about the monastic orders, or anything of that sort? Questions? This has been continuously occupied since it was built.
It has. In fact, it's been continually, continuously uh, occupied. There have been people there since the 300s. We actually have a record that goes back to the early 300s, which was, um, that was around the time that St. Helena went there and said, she's the one that went there and said, this is Mount Sinai. This is where, this is the burning bush. This is where Moses got the, uh, the law, the Ten Commandments. And from that time, we actually have a written record from a woman who visited there in the, a little bit later in the 300s. There were already monks who were living there. That's before this fortress was built. This was built in the 500s by Justinian, the guy who built Hagia Sophia. But from the 300s, there were people living here because this had been identified as a holy site. Any other questions? When you're there, make sure you spend some time in the museum Make sure you spend some time looking at this stuff because you will be seeing some of the most extraordinary artifacts in the history of Western culture, not just of Christianity, but in Western culture. Thank you all very much. I appreciate it. Nice oh, yes. Yeah.